Hello friends, I'm Chad Wakarvi and this is Faithful Performance. We explore the testimony of the biblical prophets and how they perfectly correlate with the current events of today. Thank you for joining us. Friends, in this episode we're going to start our embarkment on this journey of my second book, God's Fishermen, Satan's Hunters, The Unspoken Biblical Prophecy That Is Terrorizing the World. Uh, we did an introduction to this video a series that we're doing on the second book. Uh, in last week's video, you can check that out on my website or my YouTube channel. But in this week, we're going to start the process of the book and we're going to lay the foundation of why Jeremiah uh, wrote this prophecy in Jeremiah 16. I call it the prophecy of the fishermen and the hunters. Okay, and we're going to go through the prophecy first, but then we'll go through the foundation of why Jeremiah wrote the prophecy. Prophecy. But it's important as we begin that we're starting to see all of the biblical prophets, the prophecies written in the Bible, uh, start to come to fruition with all of these things we're seeing with the current events. And this prophecy in Jeremiah 16 is no different. But he wrote this prophecy for a specific reason. He wrote it because of the everlasting covenants. And if you're not familiar with God's everlasting covenants, they're very important to understand not only for the biblical prophets and the prophecies for the end of the age, which includes Messiah's second coming and his millennial reign, but also for our theology, also for us to understand uh, the way the process worked uh, to Jesus, to Yeshua, his salvation for all of us. Uh, it was a process of covenants, uh, if you will, that build and extend upon each other. And we're gonna go through those. So we're gonna look at it in two different aspects. Number one, for Jeremiah's prophecy, because that's what the video series is about the fishermen and the hunters, but also for our theology as, as, as well. So I hope you join us for this 10 video series uh, on the book, and we'll begin uh, with God's everlasting covenants in this week's episode, but I want to rewind and, and speak of the prophecy first, and then we'll get into the everlasting covenants, and then we'll go forward from there. So in Jeremiah 16, uh, 14 through 17, this is the prophecy of the book. Uh, it says, Therefore, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that it shall no more be said, The Lord lives who brought up the children of Israel from the land of Egypt, but the Lord lives who brought up the children of Israel from the land of the north and from the lands where he has driven them. For I will bring them back into their land, which I gave to their fathers. Behold, I will send for many fishermen, says the Lord, and they shall fish them. And afterward, I will send for many hunters, and they shall hunt them from every mountain and every hill and out of the holes of the rocks. For my eyes are on all their ways, and they are not hidden from my face, nor is their iniquity hidden from my eyes. So the Lord tells us that basically there's going to be a greater exodus, okay, from the world, from the nations around the, in the world than there was from the exodus in Egypt, okay, from Egypt. Uh, that's what he says. That no longer he'll be called the Lord lives who uh, brought him out of Egypt, but from the rest of the world, which tells us there will be a greater exodus. Uh, we discussed that in the introduction of last week's video, and we're going to get into this specific prophecy in next week's video. But I wanted to lay the foundation that Jeremiah tells us that there's going to be an exodus from the nations, okay, and it's going to be greater than the exodus from Egypt, which obviously we're seeing right now, and we'll go through the statistics more next week, but then he also tells us how he's going to do it, okay, he's going to send for the fishermen to fish them back, and then afterwards, which is important, fishermen first, then afterwards, the hunters will provoke uh, the children of Israel, the Jewish people back home, because of the everlasting covenants because of the things that we're about to go through, these covenants that we're about to go through, those promises, those eternal promises that the Lord God Almighty has made uh, to the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and David. So this is the reason why he wrote it. He tells you that in the scripture that because of the fathers, because of the promise to inherit the land. So we want to go through the prophecy first, uh, which we have, and now we're going to uh, lay the foundation of the everlasting covenants for the prophecy but also for our own theology. It's so important as we're seeing uh, what's called replacement theology out there, which basically says that the church, the Western Gentile church has replaced Israel with the promises. And basically that's from the pit of hell, okay? That's demonic, satanic, okay? Because 
that means that God has lied, okay? And we, as we know, God cannot lie. He's a truth teller. He's a covenant keeper. And that's why it's important for our theology to matter. And, and sadly enough, it's not preached in the uh, pulpits of our churches about these covenants, about how important these covenants are so that we can have the right theology going forward and so that we can understand what God is telling us through his covenants, that we can stand with Israel, stand with the Jewish people, and how the Gentiles are grafted into that. So we're going to get into the covenants covenants, okay, who they were made with, but we're also going to uh, go through how the Gentiles are part of these covenants as well at the end of it, okay? So we're going to go in order of the Bible, okay, the Holy Bible, and we're going to tie all this in together, number one, for our, uh, the prophecy of the fishermen and the hunters, and then for our theology as well. So God's plan of salvation, that's basically of what, what this is, okay? The covenants are His plan of salvation. He's always had a plan of salvation for Jew and Gentile. From the very beginning, uh, He's always had plan A. There's no plan B, okay? God didn't change His mind whatsoever, okay? He's always had one plan uh, for salvation for Jew and Gentile, and it all starts, we can go back into Genesis 3.15, okay? This is where He, he really proclaimed that there was going to be a seed or a son, if you will, that's going to come upon this earth that was going to have salvation or give his life for salvation for all of us. Okay, so we can find this in the very, uh, very beginning uh, of the Bible in Genesis 3.15. So that seed that we're about to discuss is going to, we're going to see how paramount that was as we go forward with the covenants, okay? So in the Garden of Eden, in Genesis 3.15, it says this. In verse 14, it says, so the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. And on your belly you shall go, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. And he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. So this is where it all begins, God's plan of salvation, where there was going to be a seed, okay, uh, between uh, God's seed and Satan's seed, okay? There was going to be a war uh, going on, just like he said, enmity between both seeds, okay? So we have to understand that that seed is going to go forward into the covenants, and then it's going to manifest itself out upon the earth, which is Jesus, Yeshua the Messiah, and then at the end of the age, he's going to crush uh, the serpent's head, and as we know, his heel was bruised at Passover when he died for our sins, uh, Isaiah 53, Psalms 22. So it's important, right when uh, mankind failed the Lord God Almighty, he uh, gave three uh, judgments upon Adam, Eve, and then the serpent, and this is what we're getting into against the serpent, against Satan, the adversary, and we're going to see these two seed lineages, if you will, come to fruition in this book or in the prophecy of the fishermen and the hunters. We're going to go identify these lineages for you, okay, and then it'll make better sense. So in Genesis 3.15, God said that he was going to have a seed from the woman. This is talking about Israel, ultimately, okay. Uh, yes, it came from Eve, but really you can put Israel uh, in there. You can go to Revelation 12 as well. The woman is Israel, but also we can look at it from Eve as well. Okay, so it's important to set the foundation right in the beginning of Genesis 3.15 that there's going to be a seed, and that seed is going to be a part of these covenants which we're about to get into. So now we're going to look into God's everlasting covenants and the covenants that I'm speaking of is the Abrahamic, the Davidic, and the New Covenant. They all work together, uh, they build and extend upon each other, and the Abrahamic Covenant is the foundation covenant, the foundational covenant for the rest of the covenants. The Davidic and the New Covenant, they're going to work together as we see also, it's going to work together with Genesis 3.15 uh, as we understand that. But this is the concrete foundation of our plan of salvation. This is where it comes from, okay? We all know that uh, Jesus, Yeshua, is the Messiah. He is the seed. He is the Son of God. He's the Son of the Most High, the Son of the Highest, which we'll confirm through these covenants. But it's important to understand how these covenants work for our theology, but also this is why Jeremiah uh, wrote the prophecy. Okay, so God chose one man, okay? His name was Abraham. Most of us know this story. His name was Abraham. He chose Abraham to bring salvation ultimately through Jesus, okay? And we're going to go through this for all of our salvation, but it all started with uh, Father Abraham, which that's what his name means. In Strong's 85, his, his name means a great father, a father of the multitude, okay? And the seed of Genesis 3.15 will go 
forward into uh, the Abrahamic covenant as we will see and it's important to understand that he was going to be a blessing to Abraham not only to Israel but also to the nations in Genesis 12 2 through 3 it says I will make you a great nation this is the Lord talking to Abraham I will make you a great nation I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing I will bless those who bless you and I will curse him who curses you and in all the families of the earth you shall be blessed what a great blessing uh, that Abraham received uh, from the Almighty okay but he was going to make him a great nation which is Israel okay he was going to bless those who bless him curse those who curse him that's why it's important to stand uh, with Israel and stand with the Jewish people and support them and then it says in you all families of the earth shall be blessed which what a great promise that tells you Gentiles are included into uh, Israel's tree if you will and we're going to go through the scriptures uh, at the end that confirm how Gentiles are grafted in how we're part of the commonwealth of Israel and this is where it starts in Genesis 12 all families of the earth will be blessed uh, because of uh, Abraham so this is important and it's important to understand that the Abrahamic covenant okay which is the promise to Abraham and we're about to get into this it's an everlasting covenant everlasting means everlasting okay and more importantly or just as important it is unilateral it is unconditional it's irrevocable unilateral only God said he was going to do this unconditional it did not depend on Abraham it only depends on God's sovereign righteousness and the third is irrevocable no one can revoke this okay it's everlasting it's eternal and God will fulfill his Abrahamic covenant and this covenant has not been completely and ultimately fulfilled yet well we've seen par partial fulfillments but it will be fulfilled when Jesus returns for a second coming and throughout his millennial kingdom and we're going to show you these uh, scriptures that prove that so this is the foundational covenant okay you have the seed in Genesis 3:15. now you have the Abrahamic covenant this is the foundational covenant for all of the biblical prophecies for the end of the age this is what Messiah is going to come to do he's going to fulfill the Abrahamic covenant okay but it's also for our theology as well uh, for us to understand how God's plan of salvation works for Jew and also Gentile if you're not familiar with those terms uh, that's how God classifies uh, the nations as Jewish or Gentiles so if you're not Jewish then you're a Gentile I was born a Gentile okay but we're going to get into the understanding of the born Gentiles are no longer Gentiles when they accept Jesus as the Messiah we are grafted in we're part of the Commonwealth of Israel and I will give you New Testament scriptures uh, to confirm that but let's go through the Abrahamic Covenant and then we're going to get into the two promises of the Abrahamic Covenant there's more but we'll get into the two that are really important for us to understand in our theology and also Jeremiah's prophecy and we'll begin with Genesis 17 1 through 7 when Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, <clears throat> I am Almighty God. Walk before me and be blameless. I will make my covenant between me and you, and I will multiply you exceedingly. Then Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be a father of many nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be called Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful. I will make nations of you, and kings come from you. I will establish my covenant between you and your descendants, between me and you and your descendants, after you and their generations for an everlasting covenant to be the God to you and your descendants after you. I mean, this is such a great blessing, and it's important to understand the terminology that the Lord used in here. Multiple times, five or six, seven times, he said, I will, I will, I will. Not, if you do this, I will do that. He said, I will do this, I will do this. So, as we know, when the Almighty says, I will do something, he's going to do it. Okay, that is for sure. So, he made a, he made a covenant with Abraham, the Abrahamic covenant. He's going to be the father of many nations. It goes back to Genesis 12, 2 through 3, what we just read. And he said, he's going to make a covenant with Abraham. Abraham also his descendants and we're going to see who which descendants he made the promise to through the pure royal lineage uh, to the Messiah but this is going to be an everlasting covenant again everlasting means everlasting I mean I don't think we can all get our heads around it but everlasting is everlasting okay and this is a unilateral ag agreement again I will I will he didn't require Abraham to do anything he said I will 
uh, do this. Of course, he wanted Abraham to walk blameless. He wanted him to follow uh, the, the commandments of the Lord. Of course so. But that's why he chose Abraham, because he knew he was going to do it. And he says, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. It's a unilateral everlasting covenant, unconditional and irrevocable. And it's so important. As we know, God cannot lie. He is a covenant keeper. He is a truth keeper. You can find that in Numbers 2319 and also in Titus uh, 1 through 2. So now I want to discuss real quick before we go forward uh, the difference between the Abrahamic covenant and the Mosaic covenant. The Mosaic covenant is the Sinai covenant, uh, the, the Torah, when he made the covenant with Israel after they left Egypt. Uh, the difference between those two covenants, uh, some believe the old covenant is um, the Abrahamic covenant, which is false. Okay, The old covenant is the Mosaic covenant, the Sinai covenant, the one made in uh, right outside of Egypt and everywhere in the scriptures, even in the New Testament, Paul confirms that. When he speaks of the Old Covenant, and we're going to get into those scriptures, he speaks of the one made from Egypt, okay? The Abrahamic Covenant is the promise. The Mosaic Covenant, the Sinai Covenant, is if you do this, then I will do that, okay? It is bilateral, it is conditional, and it is revocable, okay, for that specific generation. And you can look at it almost like uh, the destruction and the exile of the children of Israel at Babylon. The Mosaic Covenant came into play there because they were exiled because they did not keep uh, the covenant with Lord. Okay, if they didn't do that, so the Lord exiled them. But because of the Abrahamic Covenant, the promise, a new generation was raised to go inherit the land 70 years later. Okay, uh, that is, that's how it works. So they, they are two different covenants, the Old Covenants, the Mosaic Covenant, the Abrahamic Covenant is the promise that God will ultimately fulfill at Messiah's second coming, his millennial reign, when the children of Israel say, you are my God, and God will say, you are my people, okay? And we'll, we'll go through those scriptures with the new covenant. So it's very important to understand the difference between those two so our theology is right. Uh, some people will read the prophets and say, oh, God's through with the Jewish people. He's done with the children of Israel. He's divorced them. They're just reading snippets of, of just that specific generation, okay? But the Abrahamic covenant, the promise, you look at what's happened now. If he was done with them, then 1948 wouldn't have occurred. 1967 wouldn't have occurred when they became a nation, when they recaptured Jerusalem, okay? And then I've got plenty of Messianic Jewish friends, okay, that believe in Yeshua, okay, the Lord, Jesus, okay? So if he's done with them, then why are we seeing this happen? He's not done with them because of the Abrahamic covenant and for many other things. So it's important to understand that, that uh, God cannot lie. He made a promise to Abraham. He's going to fulfill that throughout the generations, but ultimately as a nation is going to be at the second coming in the millennial kingdom when he fulfills these covenants. In Galatians 3, 15 through 18, it says this, Brethren, I speak in the manner of men, though it is only a man's covenant, yet if it is confirmed, no one annuls or adds to it. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say into seeds as of many, but as of one, and to your seed who is Christ. And this I say, that the Torah, which was 430 years later, cannot annul the covenant that was confirmed before by God in Christ, that it should be made the promise of no effect. For if the inheritance is of the law, the Torah, it is no longer of the promise. But God gave it to Abraham by promise. So Paul's confirming us. Galatians 3 is so important for us to understand uh, for many reasons, and we'll go through it uh, later on as well. But Paul is saying that the Mosaic Covenant cannot annul the Abrahamic Covenant. The Abrahamic Covenant is the promise. Okay, the Mosaic Covenant, it is bilateral. It is conditional. It is revocable depending on that specific generation or generations before the Lord uh, puts his hand of judgment down and he exiles them, which he's done twice. And there'll be one more bad time for them. As we know, the time of Jacob's trouble You'll see that Mosaic Covenant come to fruition again, okay? And then because of the Abrahamic Covenant, which Jesus will fulfill at his second coming, they will inherit the land, second coming, millennial reign, thousand years, and we're all grafted into that covenant. So it's very important to understand the difference between those two because you get into anti-Semitism, replacement theology, etc. if one believes that uh, God has is finished and he has divorced uh, the Jewish people forever. That is demonic, that's satanic, that is a lie from the pit of hell. And he will, you're basically, someone would be basically calling God a liar by saying that because of the Abrahamic covenant. Uh, hallelujah. Okay, so now there's two aspects that we're going to go through, two key aspects that we're going to go through with the Abrahamic covenant. And that is the promised seed 
and also the promised land. Again, this is why Jeremiah in Jeremiah 16 wrote the prophecy of the fishermen and the hunters is because of the Abrahamic covenant. Remember, uh, he speaks of the new covenant as well, Jeremiah does, but he had the foundation of the Abrahamic covenant and we're going to see how all these covenants work together. So we'll go through the two key aspects, the promised seed and also the promised land and we'll begin with the promised land that's mentioned in the Abrahamic covenant. In Genesis 12, 7, it says, Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this land. In Genesis 13, 14 through 17, it says, And the Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, Lift your eyes now and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, westward. For all of the land which you see I will give to you and your descendants forever. And I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth, so that if a man could number the dust of the earth, then your descendants also could be numbered. Arise, walk in the land through its length and width, for I give it to you. In Genesis 17, 8, it says, Also I give to you and your descendants after you in the land which you are a stranger, all the land of Canaan, as an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. So in these three scriptures that we find in Genesis, about the promised land, he confirms it, okay, three times with Abraham, okay, that he is going to give the descendants the land, okay, the first one in Genesis 12 is when he was journeying to the land, and he says, hey, Abraham, I'm going to give you this land where you're treading on your foot right now, okay, in Genesis 13, 14 through 17, this is after they came back from Egypt, Lot, and Abraham, they had to separate because of the quarrel between the herdsmen, etc. And Lot chose Sodom, as we know. And, and Abraham, the Lord said, hey, look at, look at this, Abraham. This is what I'm going to give to you uh, for an everlasting possession. Forever means forever. Okay. And then Genesis 17, 8. He, he describes the land of Canaan. Okay, that goes back into the curse that Noah put on Canaan, okay, in Genesis 9. Remember, Ham uh, uh, saw his father naked, and he says, Ham, the father of Canaan, okay, but he cursed Canaan, okay? So we're going to get into that in, uh, I think, the fourth video we're doing of the series about the hunters. But uh, anyhow, we're going to see these covenants come to fruition, uh, just like he said, and the curse of Canaan came from Noah. Actually, a lot of people don't know that, but the curse of uh, Noah put a curse on the land of Canaan, and God fulfilled it through his Abrahamic covenant. And this is why we're seeing the quarrel today. This is why we're seeing the division today. This is why we're seeing the fight for the deed to the land between the Israelis and the Muslims, okay, the Arabs and the Jewish people. Okay, so it's important to see this is the battle line, is the deed to the land, the Abrahamic covenant. And it's important to realize that, okay? So that's the promised land that we see. And God has a lot of that. He's going to fulfill that. They haven't received all of the promised land of the Abrahamic covenant covenant because again that will be fulfilled at Messiah's second coming and throughout his millennial reign when you read Ezekiel 40 through 48 that's a millennial reign scriptures okay of what's going to be going on and that's when they will inherit every single inch of the promised land that's mentioned in the Abrahamic covenant okay so now let's go to the promised seed of Abraham okay the promise of the Abrahamic covenant the promised seed and it's important to understand that there was going to be a pure royal lineage okay it had to be pure as we know Jesus Yeshua he's pure he's without blemish it had to go through a specific lineage okay for it to remain pure okay and it started uh, you can think of it even in Genesis 9 Shem okay the God of Shem uh, a lot of people believe that or not a lot but some people believe that uh, he was uh, the king of Melchizedek okay the king of Salem Shem was the God of Shem uh, the Jewish people call Hashem, that's what they call the Lord God Almighty, Hashem, going back to Shem, the lineage. And it went through Shem to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, and ultimately to Yeshua, okay? So it's important to realize it had to be a pure royal lineage uh, through that. So, and uh, it's going to be the same seed that came from Genesis 3.15. Remember, it all goes back to the promise of Genesis 3.15. We'll call it the Garden Seed, okay? Uh, the Garden of Eden Seed. And then the Abrahamic Covenant Seed is the same seed uh, that was mentioned in Genesis 3.15, okay? But there was going to be a promised seed. It was going to go through Isaac and Jacob and David. But the ultimate seed, the seed, as Paul said in Galatians 3 that we just read, is Christ, is Jesus, is the Messiah, Yeshua, okay? In Genesis 15, 1 through 7, it says, After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. 
But Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me, <clears throat> seeing I go childless, and the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus? Then Abram said, Look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one shall not be your heir, but one who comes from your own body shall be your heir, a seed. Then he brought him outside and said, Look now towards heaven and count the stars if you are able to number them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. And he believed the Lord, and it was accounted to him as righteousness. Then he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans uh, to give you this land to inherit it. So what a beautiful confirmation that the Lord gave Abraham. He confirmed that he was going to have a seed from his own loins, okay, that was going to inherit the Abrahamic covenant, the pure royal lineage that would go to the Messiah. Okay, so it's important. And then he gives him this extraordinary, one of my favorite uh, scriptures is, can you imagine in the desert where the stars are just millions, okay, they didn't have electricity back in Abraham's day, okay, and then he looks up and sees millions of stars, and that's how many his descendants were going to be. I mean, totally amazing how the Lord confirmed that with him, with his uh, signs in the heavens, his beautiful stars, and so we have to understand that he promised Abraham a seed from his own loins to inherit the Abrahamic covenant of the lineage, the pure royal lineage to the Messiah. And then he also confirms the land as well in the scripture. So during that time, after that time, uh, as we all know the story, Abraham and Sarah was not patient with the Lord. And so Sarah gave the handmaid Hagar to, Ish, uh, to uh, Abraham and they had a son called Ishmael, okay? And we're gonna get into that story on a other video, so I don't wanna go into too much detail on that. I wanna focus on the pure royal lineage. But this is what's happening, and then when we read the scriptures now, it'll make more sense. But they weren't patient on the Lord. They went against the Lord's will uh, with that. They weren't patient, and they had a, a Hagar, and Ishmael had a son called Ishmael. Okay, and uh, so we have to understand that this is where we get into this next scripture, and we'll understand the difference between the promise to Isaac, and then also the promise also to Ishmael, because he's Abraham's son. And uh, we'll get into the prophetic understanding of that in other videos, okay? In Genesis 17, 15 through 21, it says this, Then God said to Abraham, As for Sarah your wife, you shall not call her name Sarah, uh, or Sarah, you shall call her Sarah shall be her name. And I will bless her and, get, and also give you a son by her. Then I will bless her and she will be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be from her. Then Abraham fell on his face and he laughed and said, In his heart shall, shall a child be born to a man who is a hundred years old, and shall Sarah, who is ninety years old, bear a child? And Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. Then God said, No, Sarah your wife shall bear, bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. And I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his descendants after him. As for Ishmael, I have heard you before. Behold, I have blessed him, and I will make him fruitful, and I will multiply him exceedingly. He shall beget twelve princes, and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant I will establish with Isaac, from Sarah shall, whom Sarah shall bear to you at this moment next time. Then he finished talking with him, and God went up from Abraham. <clears throat> So God, this is a beautiful passage, and this is very crucial for us to understand the promise that God made to Abraham, to Sarah, that there was going to be a seed from them, okay, that was going to inherit the pure royal lineage, and also the Abrahamic covenant to go through the pure royal lineage, okay, uh, as we discussed. Abraham and Hagar had a son called Ishmael. That's why Abraham petitioned the Lord, uh, could Ishmael live before you? And God said, no, he's going to be blessed. Uh, he's going to be circumcised. And I believe that tells us there's going to be a remnant from Ishmael that's going to be saved. Of course there is. Uh, all tribes, all tongues, all nations, there is a remnant there. Ishmael was circumcised in the Abrahamic covenant. So we know that that's prophetically saying that there's going to be a remnant of Ishmael, the nation of Ishmael, Saudi Arabia, Jordan area, that's going to be saved by the Lord God Almighty. But, the God, but God blessed Abraham and Sarah with a seed, with a son, Isaac. That's where the pure royal lineage is going to go through, uh, that went through ultimately to the Messiah, uh, Yeshua. And this is going to be an everlasting covenant. Okay, he confirms it again. Everlasting means 
everlasting. And uh, it's important to understand that he says, I will. Okay, again, it's unilateral, unconditional, irrevocable. It did not depend on Abraham. It did not depend on Isaac either. Uh, the Lord God Almighty was going to do this. So now let's get into the, uh, the confirmation of the Abrahamic covenant as well, uh, more so in Genesis 15, uh, 8 through 20. Uh, this is one of the most beautiful passages that you will see, uh, the symbolism, and it gives us great understanding of what we've talked about before, unilateral, unconditional, irrevocable, and what a beautiful vision that the Lord gave Abraham. And uh, we'll read this real quick. In Genesis 15, 8 through 20, it says, <clears throat> and he said, Lord God, how shall I know that I will inherit it? So he said to him, bring me a three-year-old, and this is the Lord talking to Abraham, bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. Then he brought all of these to him, and he cut them in two down the middle and placed each opposite the other. But he did not cut the birds in two. And when the vultures came down on the carcasses, Abraham drove them away. Now when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and behold, horror and great darkness fell upon him. Then he said to Abram, Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, and will serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. And also the nation whom they serve I will judge, afterward they shall come out with great possessions. Now as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace, you shall be buried at a good old age, but in the fourth generation they shall return here. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. Uh, and, it, and it came to pass when the sun went down and it was dark, that behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a burning torch that passed through those pieces. On the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying to your descendants, I will give you this land uh, from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, and all of the ites, as I call it. Okay, so this is an awesome, awesome vision, uh, confirmation of what God confirmed to Abraham with the Abrahamic covenant. There's so much detail in this, and we'll go through it. He basically created a marriage aisle, okay, with the covenant between the parts. That's what it's called, is the covenant between the parts, the Abrahamic covenant. It's a beautiful uh, marriage aisle that only the Lord God Almighty walked through. Remember, Abraham was asleep, okay? He had a vision, and only the smoking oven and the burning torch, which I believe was Yeshua, was going through there by himself, which confirms that he's the one who made this quote-unquote marriage covenant with Abraham, unilateral, unconditional, irrevocable, everlasting, and it's so important to understand that. God prophesied to uh, Abraham and told him that the descendants would go down to Egypt for 400 years. Uh, he prophesied to him he would come back in the fourth generation. Okay, but this is a, a very important promise and covenant. Okay, this is a marriage aisle, just like we have marriages in and, and today, uh, it's a covenant between two people. This was one. Okay, he was the only one that went through the marriage aisle, not Abraham, which confirms again, unilateral, unconditional, irrevocable, and everlasting. And then he also confirms uh, the promised land as well uh, with all of the ites uh, that he mentioned uh, in there. So uh, I want to go through something real quick that's pretty cool. Um, E.W. Bullinger, he wrote, a no he wrote a book called Numbers in Scripture, okay, which is very profound. I would encourage you to get the book. It goes through great detail of how God uses numbers in Scripture. And he states the profound significance uh, of the of the covenants between the parts, okay, uh, the Abrahamic covenant, and please remember that the number three means divine perfection, and the number five means divine grace. So I would like to read this. I'm quoting E. W. Bullinger from his book Numbers and Scripture, <clears throat> and he records about the Abrahamic covenant, the covenant between the parts. The divine seal is seen in the choice of three animals, each of three years old: the heifer, the she goat, and the ram. These, together with the two birds, the dove and the pigeon, make five in all, marking it as a perfect act of free grace on the part of sovereign God. He continued, therefore the number five, grace, shall be stamped upon this covenant by causing it to be made with five sacrifices, a heifer, a goat, a ram, a dove, and a pigeon. Additionally, and quite remarkably, when the Lord God changed Abram's name to Abraham, he inserted the fifth letter of the Hebrew Aleph Bet, in the middle of it, which is the letter hay. It symbolizes, uh, symbolically represents the number five. The hay is also found in the Almighty's name, in the yod heh vav -Heh, and it valid validates that he stamped his grace upon the Abrahamic covenant. 
because the divine moment occurred during the confirmation of it. Of course, the Almighty is the ultimate and perfect mathematician, and he changed Abraham's name accordingly. He also commanded Abraham to summon the exact number of animals and cut them in a specific way to numerically uh, proclaim the, the number of his divine uh, grace, uh, the divine three grace upon the Abrahamic <coughs> covenant. So what E.W. Bullinger is saying is totally amazing. This is grace, okay? A lot of people believe that when Yeshua came, that's when grace started, but that is not correct, okay? Grace started in the Garden of Eden, actually, and then he continued his grace upon Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, all of us, etc. So this covenant is a grace, okay? It's perfect. It's the divine perfection of grace is what E.W. Bullinger is saying. I wanted to share that with you. I thought it was totally amazing uh, when you look at the numbers, the number three, divine perfection, grace, uh, the number five, how perfect this covenant is, and it will be fulfilled at Messiah's second coming and millennial reign ultimately, uh, all together, the promised land and the seed. Yeshua is the seed of this covenant, and we'll see how this works as we go forward. So I wanted to mention that. In Hebrews 6, uh, 13 through 18, it says this. For when God made a promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely blessing I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply you. And so, after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. Abraham. For men indeed swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is, is for them an end of all dispute. Thus God, determining to show abundantly the heirs a promise of the immutability of this counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation, who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. So what he is telling us, it goes back into the covenants of the par, uh, between the parts, okay? Uh, this was a unilateral, unconditional, and irrevocable promise. It says that, Paul confirms that many times, and we'll continue to get into Paul's scriptures, but this is so important for us to understand uh, as we go forward. And now we're going to get another confirmation of the Abrahamic covenant, uh, that when Abraham's faith was confirmed, okay? And we all know this story, so we're going to just read uh, Genesis 22, uh, 15 through 18. It says this, Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time out of heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing and not have not withheld your son, your only son, blessing I will bless you and multiplying I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore, and your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. In your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. <clears throat> so again, this is another confirmation of the Abrahamic covenant. I mean, over and over and over, everlasting, multiplying you, your descendants. You will be a blessing to all the nations. And just like Abraham withheld his only son on Mount Moriah, on what people say is Mount Moriah, uh, God did not withheld his son, okay? He, came, he sent his son to be sacrificed for all of our sins, crucified for all of our sins, and he was redeemed, and he was resurrected for all of our sins. So I thought that was an awesome parallel to mention, is it, although Isaac, he told him not to sacrifice Isaac, okay? He did uh, allow his son to be crucified for all of our sins. He ordained him before the foundation of the world, Psalms 118 and so many other scriptures, that he was going to be sacrificed for our sins. So I wanted to mention the parallel there. And the angel of the Lord said this to him, which in my opinion was Yeshua himself uh, calling out to Abraham saying, do not sacrifice your son because that was going to be his responsibility to do that uh, for us as he knew that as well. And in your seed, all of these things will happen. Again, the seed of Genesis 3.15, the seed of the Abrahamic covenant, is the same seed, and as we continue, we'll see this. So it's important to understand that, and we'll read two scriptures confirming the Abrahamic covenant, and then we'll move on to the Davidic covenant, but the covenants were made through the pure royal lineage of Isaac. We've, we showed that in Genesis 17, and now we'll confirm what God spoke uh, to Isaac as well. In Genesis 26, one through four, it says, and Isaac went to Abimelech, king of Philistines in Gerar. 
Then the Lord appeared to him, said, Do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land which I shall tell you. Dwell in this land, and I will be with you and bless you. For to you and your descendants I give all of these lands, and I will perform the oath which I swore to Abraham your father, and I will make your descendants multiply as the stars of heaven. I will give to your descendants all these lands, and in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Again, this is the same language that we're seeing that he spoke to Abraham. Okay, he says, I will do this. Okay, again, everlasting, unilateral, unconditional, irrevocable. He's going to do this. I will give you these lands, okay, that he swore to Abraham. So he's confirming the pure royal lineage goes through Isaac. Okay, I will make your descendants multiply. I will give to your descendants. Okay, he's speaking right now what we're seeing with the children of Israel but also at the end of the age when Messiah returns for his second coming in his millennial kingdom and then he says the same thing he said to Abraham in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed again it goes from Abraham to Isaac and now let's confirm it goes on to Jacob as well in Genesis 28 13 through 15 and we understand this is Jacob's ladder we all know the story of the Jacob's ladder which ultimately occurred in my opinion on Mount Moriah as well so you have all these which is the Temple Mount okay so Mount Moriah is where Isaac uh, Abraham was going to sacrifice Isaac now we have Jacob with Jacob's ladder at the same location okay and we'll read the promise to Jacob from God Almighty in verse 13 it says and behold the Lord stood above it and said I am the Lord God of Abraham your father and the God of Isaac the land on which you lie I will give to you and your descendants also your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth. You shall spread abroad to the west and to the east, to the north and the south. And in you and in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Behold, I am with you and I will keep you wherever you go. And I will bring you back to this land for I will not leave you until I have done uh, what I have spoken uh, to you. So again, the same language again. It shows you that the pure royal lineage of the Abrahamic covenant, the seed of Genesis 3.15 to Abraham. To Isaac to Jacob the pure royal lineage which ultimately goes to Jesus uh, Yeshua and he's going to do this I will do this I will do this I will keep you I will bring you back into the lamb uh, this is confirming what we're saying this is everlasting it does not depend on Abraham uh, Isaac or Jacob it did not depend on them it only depends on God's sovereign righteousness okay so the summary of the Abrahamic covenant is what we've just discussed is unilateral it's unconditional it's irrevocable it is everlasting it will be fulfilled at, uh, ultimately and completely fulfilled at Jesus's second coming throughout his millennial kingdom uh, the pure royal lineage is very important to understand from Shem to Abraham Isaac Jacob and we'll see it go through David as well this covenant is stamped with divine perfection and divine grace okay that's what it's stamped with just what we discovered with E.W. Bullinger with numbers and scriptures and again please please remember the Genesis 3:15 seed is the same seed of the Abrahamic covenant and it goes forward to the Davidic covenant and the new covenant and uh, it is the foundational covenant okay this is what it's about this is when we see the Middle East when we see the controversy of the covenant what covenant is the Abrahamic covenant the deed to the land okay and we're going to get into that and it goes back into Jeremiah's prophecy this is why Jeremiah wrote his prophecy is because of the Abrahamic covenant with the understanding of the Davidic covenant and with the understanding of the new covenant which he writes about in Jeremiah 31 so these covenants work together they're in unison together uh, the Davidic covenant builds and extends upon the Abrahamic covenant and the new covenant builds and extends upon those other two covenants the Abrahamic and the Davidic covenant which we're about to go through so we'd like to summarize this with one one more scripture that's a beautiful scripture of the Abrahamic covenant and we'll jump into the Davidic covenant in Psalms 105 6 through 12 it says O seed of Abraham his servant you children of Jacob, his chosen ones. He is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. He remembers his covenant forever, the, the word which he commanded for a thousand generations, the covenant which he made with Abraham and his oath to Isaac and confirmed it to Jacob for a statute to Israel as an everlasting covenant, saying to you, I will give the land of Canaan and as the allotment of your inheritance. When they were few in number, indeed very few, and strangers in it what a beautiful confirmation of the Abrahamic covenant and as we can see over and over the promises the everlasting promises the eternal promises of this covenant 
and we'll get into how Gentiles are a part of this as well, okay, of the Abrahamic covenant. We'll confirm that with the scriptures as well. Now let's move on to the Davidic covenant. Okay, like I said, the Davidic covenant builds and extends upon the Abrahamic covenant. Uh, it works in unison together. And what we're going to see is it's a unilateral, it's an unconditional, it's an irrevocable, it's an everlasting promise that God made to David that will confirm the Abrahamic covenant. And uh, we will see how the pure royal lineage goes through David as well. We'll go through that in also the New Testament. And this only depends on God's sovereign righteousness as well. It did not depend on David or his descendants. So we find the Davidic covenant in 2 Samuel 7, and we'll read verses 10 through 14 and also verse 16. <clears throat> now therefore thus you shall say to my servant David, thus says the Lord of hosts, I, I took you from the sheepfold, uh, sheepfold from following the sheep to be ruler over my people over Israel. And I have been with you wherever you have gone and have cut off all your enemies before you and have made you a great name like the name of uh, the great men who are on the earth. Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel and I will plant them and that they may dwell in a place of their own and move no more. Nor shall the sons of wickedness oppress them any more as previously since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel and have caused you to rest from all your enemies. Also, the Lord tells us that he will make you a house. When your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you who will come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I'll establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father and he shall be my son and your house and your kingdom shall be established forever before you. Your throne shall be established forever. <clears throat> So this is a beautiful promise that God made to David. Uh, again, it's unilateral, it's unconditional, it's irrevocable. I will do this. I will do this. It wasn't, if you do this, then I will do that. Like the Mosaic Covenant is, like we've discussed, I will. I will. Okay, so it's a beautiful thing. And he says that he is going to have a seed. The fruit of David's loins is going to uh, rule over the promised land and rule over the children of Israel. Okay, which is the same seed of the Abrahamic Covenant. The same seed of Genesis 3.15 that crushes the serpent's head. It's the same seed. Okay, and this seed is going to be the king in the Davidic covenant. So Abraham, the Abrahamic covenant seed will be the seed or king of the Davidic covenant over the promised land of the Abrahamic covenant, over the children of Israel, and the Gentiles are grafted into that. And it's important to understand he is not talking about Solomon, King Solomon. We know that King Solomon built, a te uh, built the temple, uh, built his house. But his kingdom did not last forever. As we know, when Solomon passed away, the kingdom was divided. Okay, so this could not have been talking about, uh, speaking about Solomon. This is speaking about Jesus, Yeshua, who is the fruit of David's loins, which we're about to get into. Okay, he is the seed of the Davidic covenant as well as the seed of the Abrahamic covenant, who is the seed of Genesis 3.15 as well. And he says he's going to establish this kingdom forever okay and as we know just like i've discussed solomon's kingdom did not last forever so this is a beautiful promise that the lord god made to david okay uh, and it's a everlasting covenant is unilateral it's unconditional and it's irrevocable as we will see and he will ultimately fulfill this when he returns for a second coming in millennial reign messiah he will ultimately fulfill the davidic covenant when he sits on david's everlasting throne for a thousand years which will confirm and establish, and he will fulfill the David, uh, the Davidic covenant, and then also that will establish, confirm, and fulfill the Abrahamic covenant. And uh, as we see, those uh, two covenants work together in total unison. Again, Abraham's seed, and then the promised land was promised. The two major key aspects of the Abrahamic covenant, the Davidic covenant promised a seed, same seed as Abraham, that will be king, okay, in the Davidic covenant on David's everlasting throne, over the promised land of the Abrahamic covenant, he just confirms it, builds and extends that that seed of Abraham will be the king, okay, of the Davidic covenant. And as we will see in Psalms 131.11, it says this, The Lord has sworn in truth to David, he will not turn from it. I will set up your, uh, upon your throne the fruit or seed of your body. Revelation 22.16 says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches, I am the root and the offspring or seed of David, the bright and morning star. And even King David will read this as well in Psalms 110, 1 through 2, 4 through 6. King David declares 
that Yeshua is the Lord. He says, the Lord, which is the Father, said to my Lord, which is the Son, Yeshua, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion. Rule in the midst of your enemies. The Lord has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He shall execute kings in the days of his wrath. He shall judge among the nations. He shall fill the places with dead bodies and he shall execute the heads <clears throat> of many countries. So these three scriptures confirm that Jesus is the seed and we'll get into it more, uh, the lineage here in a minute, but he is the seed of the Davidic covenant. He is the fruit of David's loins. Okay. Prophetically understanding that Yeshua is the King of Israel. He's going to reign on David's everlasting throne, which confirms the Abrahamic covenant as well. And ultimately Genesis 3.15 when he crushes uh, the serpent's head, Satan's head, okay? So this is important to understand. The Abrahamic covenant, the Davidic covenant, they work together. It's the same seed. It's just David, the Davidic covenant is declaring that this seed's going to be the king. He's going to be the king of Israel sitting on David's everlasting throne, which like we said, confirms the promised land of the Abrahamic covenant and also the seed of the Abrahamic covenant as well. This only depends on God's sovereign righteousness to be, because uh, it's unilateral, it's unconditional, and it's irrevocable, which means it is everlasting. And as we know, Yeshua is the King of Israel, okay, and the Holy One of Israel. So now let's get into how can uh, Jesus be, Yeshua be, the seed of Abraham or son of Abraham and also the seed or son of David. I mean, how, how does that work out? We have to understand that the Lord uses that uh, all through the Bible, even with Nebuchadnezzar, you know, look at Belshazzar in Daniel 5. It says, Nebuchadnezzar, your father. Well, Belsh uh, Nebuchadnezzar was not Belshazzar's father. It was his grandfather. That's just the way he, the way the Bible works. He says his father going back, uh, just like he says, the fa your fathers, you know, the children of Israel, their fathers are Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Same with Belshazzar. Father Nebuchadnezzar, even though he was the grandfather, uh, he was spoke of in the scriptures as the father. So we have to understand that's how the Bible communicates to us. But in the New Testament, uh, Matthew gives us a great understanding of this. Also in Luke, with the lineage of the Messiah, of Jesus, Yeshua, he gives us great understanding of this. In Matthew 1, 1, verse 1 and verse 16, it says, The book uh, of genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son or seed of David, the son or seed of Abraham, and Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called the Christ. So this is very important how Matthew wrote this. Why did he write it like that? The son or seed of Abraham, the son or seed of David. How could he be both? He's referring you back to the covenants. He's referring you back to this is the seed. You know, Jesus is the seed of the Abrahamic covenant. He is the seed of the Davidic covenant. And as we just discussed, those covenants work together. Okay, they just build, the Davidic covenant just builds and extends upon the Abrahamic covenant. That seed of Abrahamic covenant will be the king, uh, okay, as well over the promised land. And that's what Matthew's confirming, is he is the son of David, the son of Abraham. He wrote it for that specific reason because of the everlasting covenants, meaning that Jesus is the new covenant that's going to fulfill uh, both of those covenants. And we're about to get into the new covenant. And then he confirms uh, that Joseph was the husband of Mary. He didn't say he was the father of Jesus. He said he's the husband of Mary. So we have to understand he's given us understanding. Why is that? Well, in Matthew 1, 18, or I'm sorry, in Matthew 1, uh, 18 through 22, it says, as this. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, did not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away in secret. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take you uh, to take Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is the Holy Spirit, is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Yeshua, for he shall save his people from their sins. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled by the prophets, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is God with us. It's important to understand that this is what it's about. This is why it's written that certain way. We have to ask ourselves, why did he write son of David, son of Mary, uh, son of uh, uh, Abraham? And why was 
a husband of Mary, Joseph uh, declared that, was because this was from the Holy Spirit. This was from the promise from on high. She was overpowered by the Holy Spirit. And then as we read and continue on forward, and I believe that's why Matthew wanted to make that clear, that this was a Holy Spirit event. Okay, this was the from the Most High, that He's the Son of God. He's the Son of the Most High. Okay, and then we read Luke 1, 30-35, and this is going to confirm these things that we've just mentioned with these covenants in the New Testament, how important these covenants are to understand. And this is why Matthew wrote it this way. This is why Luke wrote it this way. In Luke 1, 30-35, it says, <clears throat> Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and he will be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and his kingdom. There shall be no end. Then Mary said to the angel, how can this be, since I do not know a man? And the angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that Holy One will, who is born will be called the Son of God. So again, Gabriel confirms not only the birth of our Savior, our Messiah, and how it's going to be with the Holy Spirit, he also confirms the everlasting covenants as well. This is totally amazing when you read the scripture. He says he will be great. Again, this is unilateral, unconditional, irrevocable, everlasting. He will be called the son of the highest. He will give him the throne of his father, David. Okay, 2 Samuel, the Davidic covenant. He's saying that this Davidic covenant is going to come to fruition, not at his first coming events, but at his second coming events when he comes with the sword, just like David did. And then he says, he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Well, that's the Abrahamic covenant as well. That's the promise of the promised land. That's the promise over the children of Israel. The Davidic covenant's the same thing. He's going to be the king, and he's going to be the Messiah as well. So this is totally amazing, and it also confirms the pure royal lineage, okay, from Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, to Yeshua, okay? The pure, it had to be pure. He is pure. He is without blemish. He is the perfect lamb of God. He is the perfect lion of the tribe of Judah as well. So we have to understand this is why they wrote it this way, Luke and Matthew. And also it's important to understand how pure this is, is both Joseph and Mary were descendants of David. Okay, so again, it had to be uh, so pure in so many different ways. Okay, pres preserving the purity of the pure royal lineage. And it's totally amazing. And Matthew's genealogy, it does trace back to Abraham, which confirms that it's for both, uh, um, I'm sorry, Matthew traces back to Abraham. Luke traces back to Adam. Uh, basically, Adam is for Jew and Gentile, the lineage, and obviously we know the covenants are made with the Jewish people first, and then we are grafted into that, and we're all the same. There's no difference. We'll get into those scriptures, but that's the order that it happened, and we have to respect that and understand that. So now we'd like to read two verses uh, that would close on the Davidic covenant, and then we'll get into the new covenant. Then we'll get into how the Gentiles are a part of this. And it all goes back into Jeremiah's prophecy, okay? Uh, we're talking about a lot of theological issues here, but it also ultimately goes back into what we're proclaiming with the book, Jeremiah 16. This is why Jeremiah wrote the prophecy, is because of the Abrahamic, the Davidic, and the new covenant, okay? And uh, we want to mention that to keep our eyes focused on <laughs> the book series, but I also think it's important while we're doing that to go over these theological issues that are so important. Okay, in Psalms 89, 3-4, through 4, and 34-37, through 37, it says this, I have made a covenant with my chosen, and I have sworn to my servant David, your seed I will establish forever, and build up your throne to all generations. Salah. My covenant I will not break, nor alter the word that has gone out of my lips. Once I have sworn by my holiness, I will not lie to David. His seed shall endure forever, and his throne as the sun before me. It shall be established forever like the moon, even like the faithful witness in the sky. This is such a beautiful prophecy. It's one of my favorite uh, understandings of not only uh, the Davidic covenant, but also the sun and the moon, the faithful witnesses in the sky. And this is what the Lord said is he will not lie to David. Once he has sworn, 
He's going to fulfill the Davidic covenant, which again fulfills the Abrahamic covenant as well. And he will not break this. He's sworn by his holiness. So if somebody thinks that the Lord is done, by, uh, done with the Jewish people because David is a Jew, okay? He's Jewish. He's Judah, okay? Then they're calling God a liar. They're calling God a covenant breaker. And if he can break his covenant with David, then he can break it with you, okay? But God's not going to do that. He's a truth covenant breaker keeper okay he's going to fulfill this he's sworn by his holiness i mean that is this is phenomenal and then he relates it to his great wit one of his great witnesses in the sky the moon and he says he will it will be established forever like the moon even like the faithful witness in the sky what a beautiful passage every time you look at the moon think about the davidic covenant which is ultimately going to fulfill the abrahamic covenant think about the promises of the everlasting covenants, the Davidic covenants that God has made. Every time we look at the faithful witness, we should be understanding this. And again, the Gentiles will be grafted into this, and we're going to go through this, okay? Now let's get into the new covenant. The new covenant is the same as the Abrahamic and the Davidic covenant. It builds and extends upon those two covenants. It does not replace them whatsoever. Uh, again, their promises, they're unilateral, unconditional, irrevocable, everlasting. The new covenant builds and extends upon the new covenant. Now, the new covenant is not first mentioned in Matthew 26 when Messiah says, hey, this is the blood of the new covenant. We're all saved by the blood of the new covenant. Okay, once you accept Yeshua as your Messiah, Jesus as your Messiah, you are a part of the new covenant, but we're not living in the new covenant. The new covenant we will be living in when he returns for his second coming. The millennial kingdom for a thousand years is the new covenant, okay? Because uh, we'll see this new covenant mentioned by the prophets, and we'll see who it's made to, okay? The children of Israel, the house of Judah, the house of Israel, and then we are grafted into that. It's so important to understand that. Of course, we're not living in the new covenant. Look at what's going on uh, in the world right now. Uh, th this is not the new covenant, okay? The new covenant will be when the king, the one true king, returns for his second coming, his millennial kingdom, and he eliminates all this evil, all the injustices. There will be righteousness. There will be justice. There will be purity. There will be no more war, no more terror. That's the new covenant. This is not the new covenant uh, that we're living in. So we need to understand this is God's final covenant of his salvation plan. Jesus is the new covenant of what he did for us. It is unilateral, unconditional, irrevocable, everlasting. Okay, and again, this is first written by the biblical prophets, and we're going to go through three of the major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, and you're going to see this new covenant established in the prophets, and then we'll go forward uh, from there. But it's first mentioned in Isaiah 59, and we'll go through this real quick. In Isaiah 59, 15 through 17, and also 20 through 22, it says, Justice is turned back, and righteousness stands afar off. For truth is falling in the street, and, and uh, equity cannot enter. So truth fails, and he who departs from evil makes him for a prey. Then the Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no justice. He saw that there was no man and wondered there was no intercessor. Therefore his own arm brought salvation for him and his own righteousness is sustained him. For he put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. He put on his garments of vengeance for clothing and was clad with a zeal as a cloak. The Redeemer will come to Zion and to those who turn from transgression in Jacob, says the Lord. As for me, says the Lord, this is my covenant with them. My spirit who is upon you and my words which I put in your mouth shall not depart from your mouth nor from the mouth of your descendants nor from the mouth of your descendants' descendants, says the Lord, from this time and forevermore. This is new covenant language. This is the, he didn't specific, uh, specifically say this is the new covenant, but of course, uh, this is he brought salvation from his own arm, Yeshua, Jesus, the right hand of the Father. He brought salvation from his own arm, righteousness from his own arm, and he put on uh, the armor of God. We find in Ephesians 6, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness. Okay, he was ready for his vengeance, so this is important. The Redeemer will come to Zion. This is Messiah. This is the new covenant. Okay, when he establishes the new covenant. Okay, and then the descendants of uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the Jewish people. This is when they will say, blessed is he. They will be his people. He will be their God, as we will see. So this is what Isaiah is speaking of. 
He's speaking of the new covenant that's made to the children of Israel. And then again, we'll discuss how we are grafted in. Born Gentiles are grafted into these covenants, okay? And then this will be forevermore. So again, we're not living in the new covenant. It will be in the millennial kingdom. So now let's move to Jeremiah. Jeremiah 31, this is where most people will understand and go to. This is where the new covenant is established. Okay, and then yes, Jesus fulfills this, okay, uh, by his blood, but then we will be living in it when he returns for his second coming in millennial kingdom. In Jeremiah 31, 1, 31 and 34, it says, At the same time, says the Lord, I will be the God of all the families of Israel, and they shall be my people. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them uh, by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant I will make to the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds, Torah, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember <clears throat> no more. So this is very important to understand. This is the new covenant. This is what the Lord is talking about at the end of the age, okay? Again, Jesus is the new covenant. His blood is the new covenant. We're saved by his blood. We're part of the new covenant. But the new covenant, we will not be living in until the Jewish people say, Baruch Ababa Shema Adonai. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They will be his people. He will be their God. They will accept them just like uh, Jeremiah has prophesied. And when he says at the same time in the beginning of this passage, we have to take the chapter breaks out of the scripture because he's continuing on from Jeremiah 30, which is the time of Jacob's trouble. So he's telling us during the time of Jacob's trouble and towards the end of it, that's when the Jewish people as a corporate nation will accept him as their Messiah and their king. When they go through these hard times during uh, the time of Jacob's trouble, that's when they will. And he does uh, differentiate between the old covenant, which is the one from Egypt, okay, and the new covenant. Okay, he does not mention the Abrahamic covenant. Okay, he's mentioning the Mosaic covenant, the one that the children of Israel broke, even though he was faithful to his covenant, they broke it. And he said, look at what he says in the new covenant. Okay, this is the new covenant from the old covenant. And the only difference is this, is what he says. I will put my Torah in their minds and I will put it on their hearts. I will be their God. Again, look at the language. I will, I will, I will, and they shall be my people. So he's telling us that the Jewish people are going to return to him as a corporate nation, okay, at the end of the age. And again, I've got plenty of Messianic friends that are Jewish, okay, the Jewish believers. So I'm talking about the corporate nation itself. That's when they will, as a corporate nation, will say, He is our God, Yeshua is our God, and He will say, These are my people, and He will do this. He will forgive their iniquity. Uh, so God is not done with the Jewish people, okay? This is the new covenant made with the children of Israel, with the, uh, with the house of Israel, house of Judah, just like Jeremiah has prophesied. So it's important to have our theology correct on this. This covenant builds and extends upon the Abrahamic and the Davidic covenant. Again, when Jesus returns, He's going to fulfill the new covenant or we'll be living in it. And then that will confirm and fulfill the Abrahamic seed, the Davidic seed, which is Jesus. He will be the king sitting on David's everlasting throne over the promised land of the Abrahamic covenant. So they all work together and they build and extend upon each other. Okay, so it's important, it's so important. And this is why Jeremiah wrote his prophecy of the fishermen and the hunters, which we're going to get into more of the time frame of this prophecy and how it will end at a certain time period during the time of Jacob's trouble. And then we'll get into the other scriptures in another video. So now let's read Ezekiel. Okay, we'll read the third major prophet. Ezekiel, this is a new covenant language as well. And just look at what he's going to do. He's going to do this, okay? In Ezekiel 36, 22 through 28, it says, Therefore say, therefore say to the house of Israel, Thus says the Lord God, I do, he's talking about the new covenant, I do not do this for your sake, O house of Israel, but for my holy name's sake, which you have profaned among the nations wherever you went. 
I will sanctify my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in their midst. And the nations shall know that I am the Lord, says the Lord God, when I am hallowed in your eyes before them. Okay? For I will take you from among the nations, gather you out of all the countries, and I will bring you into your own land. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take your heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. Then you shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers. You shall be my people. I will be your God. So Ezekiel is confirming this. This is pretty tough language uh, at the beginning, but he confirms that God's going to do this. Why is he going to do it? He's going to do it because of the Abrahamic covenant, because of the Davidic covenant, because of the promises to the fathers, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, to the patriarchs, to David. Okay, he's going to do this because he is a covenant keeper. He is a truth keeper. He's sworn by his holiness, as we have uh, seen in the scriptures, and he is going uh, to fulfill these covenants. He is going to bring them back into the land. And we're going to see how this works with the fishermen and the hunters. And then also when Messiah returns as well, look at the language he says, I will sprinkle you with clean water. I will cleanse you. I will give you a new heart and a new spirit. I will take a heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you. Then you will dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers, okay, Abrahamic, Davidic covenant. This is the new covenant that we will be living in, okay? And then you shall be my people, and I will be your God. So this is totally amazing, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, what he is confirming through his covenants. Again, Abrahamic, Davidic, new covenant, they all work together. The seed, the promises of everything, the pure royal lineage. It all goes back to Genesis 3.15 when he crushes the uh, serpent's head. And now let's read the New Covenant in the Gospels, okay? This is where most people believe the New Covenant is. But as we have seen, the New Covenant is in the biblical prophets. And then Messiah came to do his part as the blood. Remember, there has to be blood for a covenant. He shed his blood for all of us, okay? So he is the New Covenant. We need to be inside his New Covenant, but we will not be living in it until again his second coming and throughout his millennial kingdom in matthew 26 26 through 29 it says and as they were eating jesus took bread blessed and broke it and he gave it to the disciples and said take eat this is my body then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them saying drink from it all of you for this is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for many for the remission of sins but I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it, with, drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So Messiah is confirming uh, what we're talking about here. He is the new covenant. His blood is the new covenant. The shed for many for the remission of sins, he says. But then listen to what he says. But I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of this vine from now on until that day, the day of the Lord, okay, his second coming, millennial reign, when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So words do matter, and we've got to be very careful when we read this. He says, I drink it new, new covenant, okay, when he establishes the new covenant on the earth, no more war, no more terror, no more abortion, justice, righteous, everything. And then that fulfills the Abrahamic covenant, the Davidic covenant. He will rule over the land of the Abrahamic covenant. He is the seed, as we've discussed, the son of Abraham, the son of David. He is that seed who will rule over the promised land, over the children of Israel, Gentiles grafted in, which we're about to go over. And then uh, he's going to fulfill the Davidic covenant when he sits on David's everlasting throne for a thousand years. So now, uh, what about the Gentiles, okay? As you've seen, these covenants are made through Abraham, through Isaac, through Jacob, through David, through Yeshua. <clears throat> but what about the Gentiles? Well, it's so important as we look into this, and again, we just have to remember we're going through Jeremiah's prophecies, the fishermen and the hunters. But as we're doing this, I thought it was important with the theology as well to go through this. 
uh, because Gentiles, what about the Gentiles? Well, God's always had a plan for the Gentiles, you know, since the beginning. Okay, he's always had a, a plan for the Gentiles. You can almost look at it as well. Remember the story of Jacob blessing Joseph's two sons, uh, Manasseh and Ephraim. He crossed his hands, okay, Jew and Gentile. Manasseh, Jew, Ephraim, Gentiles, okay? He crossed his hands. So from the very beginning, he's had a plan of salvation. Now, it went through these covenants in order, and we have to understand that. These were made to the children of Israel, children of Abraham, but now the Gentiles are grafted in, and we're going to read a couple of these scriptures that goes with that. Okay, in Galatians 3, 26 through 29, it says this, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus, new covenant. For as many of you were baptized in Christ have put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek or Gentile. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male or female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Galatians 3 is so important for us to understand, okay, because it clarifies this. Uh, once you are saved in Messiah, okay, Jesus you are no longer a Gentile, okay? You are a seed of Abraham. Paul says this, you are a seed of Abraham and you are an heir to the promise. What's the promise? The promise is the Abrahamic covenant, okay? He's carrying you back to the Abrahamic covenant. He's telling you how important these covenants are to understand your plan of salvation for Jew and Gentile, okay? He's saying, hey, if you're a seed of Christ, you're a seed of Abraham and you're an heir according to the promise of that clarifies and that confirms what uh, we believe with this, that we are part, the Gentiles are, you're no longer a Gentile. Just like Paul says, you are part of the commonwealth of Israel. And we'd like to confirm that with another scripture by Paul in Ephesians 2, 11 through 22. It says, therefore, remember that you once Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands, that at the time you were without Christ and being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the co covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you were once far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is the Torah of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from thus the two, thus making peace and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, there putting the death to enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who are far off and those who were near, for through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. Now therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you are also being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. This is so important, so imperative, so paramount for us to understand as Gentile believers that we are no longer Gentiles. When you accept Jesus as your Messiah, you're no longer a Gentile. Okay, you are in the commonwealth of Israel. Okay, going back to the covenants, just like Galatians 3 says, a seed of Abraham. You were grafted in to the commonwealth of Israel. The Jews are grafted in too. It's, it's, Israel, it's uh, God's tree. It's God, God is the Israel's tree, okay? Messiah, Yeshua. We are grafted into this tree, and we it's so important on so many levels. We need to be worshiping like he's commanded us to as well, instead of the paganism that we see in the Gentile church. So we have to understand that we're into the commonwealth of Israel, okay? We were strangers of the covenants. I mean, Paul clearly says this. We were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, that's plural, Abraham, Davidic, and new covenant, okay? We were strangers, but once you received Jesus as your Messiah, who is the new covenant, and also it confirms you're part of the Abrahamic and the Davidic covenant as well. So we have to understand the, the importance of these covenants. Jeremiah, that's why he wrote the prophecy of the fishermen and the hunters. That's why he wrote a lot of the prophecies is because of these covenants. We have to have this covenant foundation correct in our theology. But now when you're saved by Yeshua, saved by Jesus, okay, you're no longer a stranger. You're in the commonwealth of Israel. As it says, we should be one body, Jew and Gentile, male and female. There's no separation. He's broken down that wall of separation, as Paul says. We are one new body, 
be one new man. A uh, Gentile shouldn't be worshiping this way and Jews this way. We worship according to the Holy Bible, according to Torah, prophets, etc., Psalms. Okay, that's what we, it says that. It, we're founded upon the prophets and the apostles. We have to understand that's how we should be worshiping one Torah for the citizen, one for the stranger, just like Exodus 12 says. You can read it for yourself in verse 3, 47 through 49. There's one Torah. If you're in the commonwealth of Israel, which you, by Jesus, by Yeshua, there's one Torah for the citizen, Jewish, stranger, Gentile. But now you're no longer a stranger once you accept Jesus as the Messiah. And he is that chief cornerstone. And we have to understand that this is so important, these covenants. Okay, so now... And you can also read Romans 11 as well. It goes through a very important uh, scripture as well. Romans 11, uh, that's for another uh, video, if you will, because of the length of the chapter. But Romans 11 also tells us that we are grafted in. Okay, the Jewish people were grafted in. Some were broken off so that we could be grafted in. Okay, and then they will be grafted back in at the end of the age. Okay, because it's their tree because of the promises. And we have to understand in Romans 11 that it says that. And it's so important as we continue, and we'll mention the scripture again uh, in the book of the prophecy of the fishermen and the hunters, is we have to understand that even though as a nation, okay, uh, as a corporate nation, okay, the Jewish people are against the gospel. They're enemies of the gospel. Romans 11 says that. But they are the elect, okay, according to the promises, according to the fathers, according to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and David. It's so important to understand that that's why we stand with them. That's why we pray for them, okay, for the for the uh, veil to be lifted off their face, okay, because there's a veil right now. Uh, going back to the story of Moses, Paul says that as well. In the letters, there's a veil on the corporate nation. Again, I've got many friends that are Messianic Jews, Jewish believers that love the Lord. But as a corporate nation, okay, they are blinded still, partially blinded. And we need to be praying for them that the veil is lifted off. Now, ultimately, the Lord God Almighty is going to do that at the end of the age during the time of Jacob's trouble. They will be his people. He will be their God he will say that once they repent, it goes back to the story of Joseph. Once Judah repented, Joseph revealed himself. Once the Jews repent as a nation, okay, the Lord's going to come and he's going to rescue his people, okay? That's the bottom line. So we need to understand that we have to have our theology correct. And it's so important as we continue this process of this book, God's fishermen, Satan's hunters, to understand that they are the elect, okay, because of the promises made to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and David. And yes, uh, they will eventually receive the gospel. They will eventually receive the good news, uh, just like other Gentiles as well, okay? So it's important to understand that. It's important to understand these everlasting covenants, okay? They are everlasting. They're unilateral. They're unconditional. They're irrevocable. Everlasting means everlasting. God is going to fulfill this, and he's going to fulfill it through Jesus, Yeshua, the Messiah. Messiah of the world, okay? He is the seed in Genesis 3.15 that's going to crush the serpent's head. That same seed is the seed of the Abrahamic covenant, which is Jesus, okay? That's going to rule over the promised land in the Abrahamic covenant. The Davidic covenant confirms that he's going to be the king over David's everlasting throne over the land of the Abrahamic covenant. And it's the same seed. And then obviously the new covenant, okay? He was the seed that came from the blessed Holy Spirit. He is the new covenant. It's made with the house of Israel, the house of Judah. Gentiles are grafted into these covenants, just like we've discussed. And the new covenant will be fulfilled. And we will be living in it at the millennial kingdom, okay? Second coming millennial kingdom. That's when the new covenant will be established because that's when, according to the new covenant in Jeremiah 31, the children of Israel as a nation will say, Baruch Ababa Shem Adonai, blessed is he who comes in the, Lord, in the name of the Lord. He will be... Uh, their God, they will be his people, just like the prophet said in Jeremiah 31, Ezekiel 36, Isaiah 59 and 60, uh, goes into Romans 11. All of these things are so important to understand. This is why Jeremiah wrote this prophecy of the fishermen and the hunters is because of the everlasting covenants. That's why we wrote about these covenants in the first chapter of the book, is to set the foundation, not only to this prophecy, but to everything. This is what it's about, is because of what we mentioned in the introduction of, the, of it, is that's what Satan wants to come against, is the deed to the land. If he can show that God's a liar, then he wins. Of course, he's not going to do that. 
That's why it's important to understand these everlasting covenants because they haven't been fulfilled yet. That's why the controversy, what you're seeing today uh, in Israel, okay, is the deed to the land. We're going to get into these different lineages, but what we wanted to confirm now is the seed, the pure royal seed, okay, went through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and David, and Yeshua is the fulfillment, the ultimate fulfillment. He is the seed that's going to fulfill all of these covenants. And that's why you're seeing the controversy of the land now, of the deed to the land, and he will resolve this. Okay, we could all try to be a part of uh, making it right here on earth, the presidents and all these things, the nations, but he's the one that's going to establish the Abrahamic covenant, the Davidic covenant, the new covenant at his second coming throughout his millennial kingdom. That's why it's so important to watch what's going on in Israel. But at the same time, this prophecy that Jeremiah has written, the fishermen fish their people back. And then the hunters after that will provoke them back, okay? It's important to understand it's because of the promise, the everlasting promise of the Abrahamic, the Davidic, and the New Covenant, okay? So it's important to understand that. Uh, we'll get into that as we go further. In next week's video, we're going to discover uh, the prophecy itself, the prophecy of the fishermen and the hunters. We're going to read it, but then we're going to go through the details of why this prophecy has not been completely fulfilled in history when Jeremiah wrote it. But now we're going to start to see how it is starting to be fulfilled or it began to be fulfilled in 1948. And we've just seen the escalation of this prophecy. And, and we'll get into more details further than that once we establish uh, the prophecy itself. We'll figure out who is God's original fisherman who the original hunters were, which will give us insight who the end of the age fishermen and hunters are. And then we'll go from there to confirm it and bring it up to date with all the statistics and things like that. So I wanted to present this to you, friends. It's so important to have our theology correct, okay, with this, uh, to have an understanding of the covenants itself uh, for our theology. So we do not get uh, caught up into replacement theology, which we've discussed before, which is which is demonic, okay? God is not finished with the Jewish people, with the children of Israel, just like we've discussed scripture after scripture, prophet after prophet, Old Testament, New Testament, everywhere. It says he is not finished with his people because he is a truth teller, okay? He is sworn by his holiness, okay, to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to David. And it's so important for us to understand this, okay? And then also we're dealing with the prophecy as well. This is why Jeremiah wrote the prophecy. So, friends, I hope you stay with us, you know, for this 10-part uh, series uh, that we're going to do with the book. Uh, it's going to be fascinating. You will see uh, through the factual evidence that we're seeing uh, currently on this earth, okay, and through the past few decades that we're seeing this prophecy escalate and intensify as we continue forward uh, to the end of the age. So, uh, friends, thank you for joining us. And until next time, may God bless you, may he keep you, may his face shine upon you and give you his grace. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you and your family his everlasting shalom. My name is Chadwell Carvey and you reach Faithful Performance.